Hi, my name is Jonathan Hicks. I'm back at the Dice Club, and this evening I'm joined by Steve, Matt, and the and we just finished playing Vindication, uh, which, as you can see, has got lots of bits to it. Uh, it's a kind of resource management game with some area control. You can see the cubes of various places, uh, players here are uh, indicating control of the various regions. Now, at the start of the game, you take your sort of standee and you start at the edge of the map. The idea is you've washed ashore on this island and you're trying to redeem yourself for past misdeeds. So you, on your turn, typically you move, so you can go up to a certain number of spaces, uh, you have a, a speed here, and it's possible to upgrade this later on in the game. You can increase your speed to three or four by getting certain mounts. Uh, but you move to a certain location, and then you activate one of the three areas around that location. Now, the areas are going to do a variety of things. Some of them are just going to get you resources. There are three basic resources. You've got red resources, which are represented here by strength. You've got yellow ones, which are inspiration and you've got blue ones which are knowledge and to indicate that you've got them if I were to gain a strength you take cubes from your board from the influence section this is like available cubes and you put it on the appropriate space so if I gain a strength I put it here and now I have one of the red resources so uh, if I had moved to here for example I could activate this and this would get me two strength so I take two from here and you stick it there uh, so those are the three basic resources but you can also get the secondary colors if you like the better resource which is the orange the green and the purple and the way you do that is you kind of combine them like paint I suppose so I could take one red and one yellow and combine it to make an orange and the extra one just goes back to the board because that's not used so that's the resources they're kind of represented you can see how many resources everyone's got by looking at where the cubes are around the edge of the board so yeah so some locations just get you the basic resources some location, uh, locations let you get companions so if you go to the inn for example the three uh, basic colours, primary colours, let you get three kinds of companions. You've got yellow companions, blue companions, and red companions. Uh, so if I were to go to the inn, I could spend two of the appropriate resource. If I wanted a yellow companion, I'd spend two of my yellow resources. And then I can either take the face-up companion or I can take a blind one here. And they're going to give you some honour, which is actually like victory points. You can see we're tracking the victory points around the edge of the game, uh, the board here. Uh, but they're also going to give you some kind of special ability that you can use. So you go around visiting the locations, but one other thing you do on your turn as well as visiting a location is you activate one of your companions. You see as well as this yellow one, I've got some blue ones, a couple more yellow ones. You stick an influence on them and you get the stuff at the top left. So in this case, that's going to give me two blue resources. Just for activating that companion, I'll take my resources and indicate I've got two blues now. Uh, and again, they're going to have very special abilities. So for example, this one, if I were to activate her, I could convert one of my blue ones into a yellow one or a red one. But you can only use the ability of a companion that you've actually activated, and you can only activate one every turn. Uh, so other things you can do then, you can try and get these secondary cards, if you like. There's the green ones, the purple ones, and the, yellow, uh, the orange ones are kind of better cards. So if you go to the ancient tomb, hand in two greens, you can get a trait, which is a kind of like special ability throughout the game. So for instance, this one gives you two honor each time you convert to um, a particular... I think this is supposed to be one of the resource types around the edge of the game. So I think this is the purple one. When you get when you get purple, you're going to get honour for that one. And also gives you quite a lot of honour, you can see, just for getting the card. So that's the green ones. Uh, the purple ones are... They're relics, and when you acquire them, let's say I were to get this relic by spending two purple, you stick to uh, up to three of your cubes on it, actually, and then you can activate this once per turn, so I can activate it by spending that, and I can do the special ability. In this case, return one influence, and I can move my colours around, which is handy. And the next time I use it, I can use it again, but eventually it's going to become exhausted. And you, you can go back to the arcane tower, which is where you get the purple ones, to kind of recharge your relics. And the last one, then, is the orange one, which is the gaping moor where you fight monsters. Uh, so, you, again, you can either take the face-up one or one of the blind ones. Combat's very simple. You allocate one of your people as a champion, and you roll both the dice. We've got two dice here. And effectively, you're going to get some resources. That gets you an orange resource. And then potential consequences. In this case, that's quite bad, because the guy dies. Your champion would just die at that point. Uh, there are some other things. There is a blank, which does nothing, or a fatigue, which means you have to add extra influence on because you're putting these cubes all over the place and one key aspect of the game is you kind of run out of these cubes so in that case you want to go and visit the monastery and the monastery lets you upgrade your cubes you have all these potential cubes at the start of the game and every knowledge you spend at the monastery lets you upgrade a cube to here or you can upgrade cubes from here to conviction now conviction is used for the area control so when you visit a region let's say i visited the uh, holy spire here to get yellow resources i can take one of my conviction and plonk it on, I get two points, and that's also worth two points at the end of the game. 
Or if I went somewhere like the inn that someone else controlled, if they control it, they get two points every time I use it. So you're getting points when other people use your regions. But if I want to take control of it, because they've already got it, I'd have to spend two conviction. One just gets returned, and the other one kind of kicks them out, and then it means that I now control this particular region. So as I say, at the end of the game, you're getting two points for every region that you control. You're also getting uh, points for majorities in the different colours. So for every blue card, you kind of count the number of blue cards, and whoever has the most blue cards uh, gets one of these majority things. So I had the most purple cards and the most yellow cards, and you can see you're getting different points here. The different people are fighting to get the different uh, majorities in each of the colours at the end of the game. So there's a chunk of endgame scoring from that. Uh, also, incidentally, the monsters give you some endgame scoring as well. And at the end of the game, most points wins. I should just say that there's an end game trigger, there's a whole pile of these and when one of these end game triggers is sort of realised that causes the game to end uh, so for example, if I just take one that will make sense this one, when in our case five traits have been bought those are the green cards, that would trigger the game so there are certain uh, end game triggers that will cause the game to end Alright, what do we think? I'll preface, it by, I'll preface this by saying that I didn't play in this particular game. Someone else did. I've jumped in because I played uh, two weeks ago or something. Um, so I think these guys are going to like it a bit more than me because I didn't really have the best game as such. Um, I like it. This is a game where the mechanisms re link really well together. You have to be aware of everything you're doing. Cubes are a really tight resource. Kind of getting the area control down so you're accruing points if you can kind of get the buildings that other people do. It's really nice. And so in theory, this is a game that I would... Uh, quite like. It feels a bit like, as I was playing it, that it feels a bit like a thinkier version of Century Spice Road. You're kind of sailing around the map, putting cubes down, like the huts in Century Spice Road, kind of trying to build up an engine, two guys that work well together, these get to the blue stuff, and then you can convert the blue stuff into this. So, a bit like that. Um, but the bit I really didn't like, uh, which kind of soured me, and I really need to play it again, because if I just go off this one rating, uh, it's not a... Uh, it, it's a game I think I'd like more than I actually did, is the end game scoring. So at the start of the game we played, the, the, the end game trigger, sorry. The, at the start of the game we played, there were two things that we were miles off from doing. So I went around and I bought a couple of green cards and Jonathan bought a couple of green cards. And then as you get, as the game progresses, more and more end game potential conditions come out. And the first one to come out was six green cards or five green cards. I'm like, well, we're only like one or two off that. Mark was about to buy one and then someone else just went and bought one and ended the game really quickly. And so the people who kind of focus on the engine, which this is really an engine building game, you're trying to accrue the most efficient way of kind of upgrading these resources and doing really cool stuff with it. Um, they couldn't do it. And they were going to win if it was a longer game, but the fact that this random end game condition came out of nowhere, it meant that it kind of we were all a bit let go. Oh, it's ended already. Um, so, yeah, I, I, these guys are probably going to say much better, much more positive things than I, I'm going to say. Um, but it, has, it does some really nice stuff, and the theme uh, is definitely there. Okay. Matt? Yes. Um, like Steve was saying, uh, he, he came over when we were about halfway through the game and said, oh, wow, it was over for us by now. And I was thinking, oh, I've, I've got so much more I want to do, and I'd be really kind of, oh no, if it was if it was ending right then. So, um, so yeah, I guess the the end game triggers can really affect the length of the game, and uh, like I said, it's an engine building game, and you you have an overall plan. I wanted to get three relics, which uh, not relics, uh, traits by the end of the game, which is a bit of a, a slog to. Get the res get the uh, the knowledge and then the inspiration and then change that to wisdom and then get to the uh, ancient tomb and get those. Uh, so it takes a good few turns to get one trait, and I wanted to get three of them. Um, so yeah, it, it was going to take me some time to get those end game points. Um, the end of the game was very close. There was three points between um, me and second place. Uh, so. So a lot of the kind of small things, uh, like controlling an inn, so that I got some points when people recruited their um, companions, I think was really kind of important during the game. So if I'd have ignored any of the little bits, I wouldn't have won. Uh, so it makes, makes quite a bit of difference, the little bits. So there's a lot of big points to be gained, but you can't ignore the, the little point parts. Um, and yeah, in terms of the theme, it has this little booklet, so there's um, there's a lot of kind of nice uh, artwork and theme in there, and it's got this little booklet that gives you a backstory of almost every kind of companion you get, 
uh, and every location on the board and some really nice artwork and just a little kind of paragraph about who these people are and what their backstory is, which is completely unnecessary for the game, but it's really nice. It's really nice that there is that complete kind of world that you can immerse yourself in. So yeah, I really like it. I think it's good. And yeah, I really liked it. Um, it's a uh, sort of game I'm generally not very good at. It's resource management. <laughs> I always sort of uh, end up sort of like, oh, I need these cubes, and then start doing other things and never get anywhere. Um, but yeah, I sort of I took a I had a quest card to kill lots of to kill three monsters and control the gaping wall. And I just concentrated on that, and about I'd probably say about halfway through the game, I thought I was lagging behind because of this because I didn't bother with traits or relics or anything else I just had a few strength people companions and a few dead monsters and I came second so I think there's a, quite a lot of different paths to victory it's, it's, you don't have to do a bit of everything you can just concentrate on a couple of things to score the points because everything I think it scores about the same, sort of same amount of points the monsters are good because that gave me a lot of end game victory points um, yeah, it's a sort of good, sort of good planning mechanics. Um, resource management is interesting. The way you combine two resources into a different one. Um, yeah, I definitely play this again. Rating? Uh, I'd probably just give this about a seven and a half to an eight. Okay. Matt, I would give it eight and a half. We also didn't get mentioned like group minis that come with it. Yeah, uh, yeah I'd I'll give talk it eight and a half. Okay, Steve? It's probably a better game than I've given it credit for. Uh, my experience, I didn't like it. If I played it again, I might be higher, but I'm going to rate it five. Okay. I think they've, all the different comments, I think, do give you a good indication of how it plays. Um, the component quality is fantastic. It does feel overproduced. As Matt was saying, there's a pile of miniatures that come with this game that aren't even used in the base game. There's lots of little mini expansion modules and each of those use the miniatures in various ways. Um, but actually, I really like it. I don't mind the fact that it's overproduced. The artwork's fantastic. As Matt said, there's lots of lore and things like that, which is great. Um, in terms of the gameplay, it's certainly very engaging. You can never do everything. You're always feeling like you constantly stretch, which is really nice. It's what you want from a Euro game. Uh, and as Andy was saying, there's lots of different paths to victory, which is nice. So you can decide to go one way for one game or a different way for a different game. Uh, although I think Steve is right. I've played this quite a few times now, and some games just do end really soon. It's like you're expecting a much longer game, and suddenly, oh, is that it? Is it over? And you do feel a little bit let down. So if there was some way of controlling the length, maybe some triggers are like medium length or longer length, and you could choose the kind of triggers you go with. Or as Steve was saying, maybe have the first person to trigger two of them or something like that. I'm sure there's a way you could house rule it. I think this would be a really solid game. Uh, I've got an 8 out of 10. All right, thanks very much for watching. That was Vindication.